John, how can you always have the right TV for the right application without carrying hundreds of valves on your truck? You can carry the hundreds of valves on a trailer behind your truck. That's too funny. That would work, but how are you going to do that? Maybe there's an easier way. You can use Sporland's interchangeable cartridge style Type Q and Type BQ uh, TEVs. Type Q is a conventional design and Type BQ is a balanced port TEV. Well, come on, I need easy. How easy is it? Uh, easy is one, two, three. And it serves thousands of unique applications. So what's the process? How do I put this together? First, you select the thermostatic element assembly. Then you select the body that you need. Then you select the right size cartridge for the application to get the proper capacity TEV for your application. And then I guess it should also be said you want to actually assemble those to a single valve. That'd probably be a good idea. Indeed. These easy to select and assemble valves mean you're always carrying the right valve for the right job then. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to sporland.com and find more information on the Type Q and BQ thermostatic expansion valves. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. Hello guys, this episode is brought to you by Fieldpiece. The tough wireless vacuum gauge MG44 from Fieldpiece is engineered to give you the reliable reading you need and the ease that you want. Confidently measure vacuums with a reliable leak-proof seal. The MG44 can be used with the JobLink system app from up to a thousand feet away. This easy to read backlit LCD offers a graphical representation of the vacuum progress even in low light or at odd angles. Visit www.fieldpiece.com for information or follow us on social media at Fieldpiece Products. Thanks again and enjoy the episode. We've all been there in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporlin, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Carell, Hussman Parts, and k -Tetherm. United Refrigeration Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc has all your solutions down cold. What's going on, everybody? And welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're here with your host, Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. What's new? Oh, just uh, running a whole bunch of service this week. No, 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 con no construction work going on. So I got the other two startup guys doing whatever startups we have. And uh, I volunteered to do a uh, service. Sort of. You travel, any, you travel anywhere? Not yet. And we have a big uh, microthermal change out here starting in Ohio as soon as uh, they find the rest of my parts that went to some random branch. Didn't that happen last time where they sent your shit to the wrong place? Uh, yeah, they, they actually sent it to Avon, Ohio instead of Avon, Indiana. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, same. we had cases show up at this place too. Like we had... The racks went to the, that store too. We were to a brand new store. The chances of Costco being in the same exact city city name is kind of 
And the same street address, like the, 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 where maybe it wasn't, I don't know. It, it was like Costco Way, so both of them were like Costco Way. Oh, shit. <laughs> no, we, uh, it's, it's, it's at least good for Costco. Like, so if you have a tractor trailer, drop off a whole bunch of cases, at least, you know, you, if they do end up taking them off, getting them back on isn't, isn't that hard. Um, I did a, a, a store up in Massachusetts, and, dude, so the cases... This place didn't have a a regular dock. It was one of those uh, metal metal dock that basically flips up the back tailgate whenever it goes up, and then brings the tailgate back down. And we were unloading, I think, uh, six door frozen foods off the thing, so we had to disable the tailgate in order to get the thing up and down. And I remember at this store, we also had to the day that the bunkers went in. It was a OW, I think it was an OWIZ or whatever, but we had to we had to <laughs> we had to rent a wrecker. To get the tr- to get the case off of the box truck, to put it on the wrecker, and then roll it down in the parking lot to get it through the front doors. Actually, uh, we were doing some cases the one day. It was like a smaller mom and pop store when I was at a different shop, and we unloaded thirty five five doors in less than like two hours with the wrecker. Wow! Yeah unload like like six at a time uh he was doing like two at a time and like we would slide them we were sliding them through the glass the plate glass window so the record was dropping them down with the bed and we were we built a ramp and we were taking them through the window (laughs) it was actually pretty it was actually pretty cool the carpenters like i mean i was i was quite you know surprised for those knuckle dragging uh like figure that out and I thought you were going to say something nice. I was like, man, they, they showed a lot of initiative. And all of a sudden, the <laughs> Neanderthals was awful. I mean, the, the, the guys basically eat butyl and cry when they got to put shelves in. Yeah. Which I, I bitch when I got to put shelves in, too, because that is probably the worst job in the world. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm going to Florida, I think, I think next week. I meant to go look at a calendar. Um, the week of the 19th, I'll be in an Orlando area. Uh, I get to go to a class for a, a certain HVAC manufacturer. Um, Must be nice. Yeah. Um, uh, well, yeah. No, I, I dig it. I mean, but like I get it because they want me to, you know, make training out of it. You know what I mean? So um, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, some people know them as EVAC systems. Other people know them as Acorn systems, but they're basically the same deal. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because Monday I was laying in a pool of water, just just getting drenched, you know, because the EVAC couldn't keep up. You know, I was trying to de-ice a case, and it just doesn't keep up. But they're so not they're they're not made for that though. They're not they're not yeah. made. Yeah, guess what happens? You know, cold things cold things freeze up, and uh, you eventually got to melt it with water. And uh, have, haven't you yeah. ever upgraded to the steamer? Like I've seen some of these guys have like a Ryobi or a Dewalt steamer that they use. So. No nozzle. No nozzle. I'm a no nozzle type of guy. Just just full full force, no nozzle. Lots of flow. That's such a fucking waste. That's such a waste of water. I you know that was one one transition from. When I moved from from Connecticut um, to Pennsylvania, or I'm sorry, Connecticut to Texas, um, I had to get used to the fact that that there was no water on top of any of the cases on any of the supermarkets that I was at. Where every other aisle on the frozen food on the East Coast had had hot, you know, hot water, even you know, right right at the dam at the cases, and you know that was I, I started at that point when I moved to Texas. I started carrying like 400 feet of hose on my truck, so I refused to do the bucket. Uh, the, you know, the bucket, the sump pump, I just, I don't. The pocket I, bucket? I, I, I can't, I, I, I won't, I won't. Cause it's, it, you know, the has, you're putting this hot water in, in the trash can and it's cooling down as it's just sitting there as you're filling it up to the 50 gallon mark. So it's well, not nearly as hot as what it was when, you know, you initially filled it. So by the time you get out yeah, there, then it's shit. Target and you get like five gallons of hot water and the rest is just like cold water i never understood why they started taking out the heat reclaim it was a preemptive leak thing i was told but we we only have like everything else. we have like i don't know the the the, bu- the bucket works it, it's not my favorite but it works it but I, I will also do wield it and get the gondola going or the the double bucket with the milwaukee sump pump with the milwaukee pump and the sump pump so you get you double the flow but then the old evac can't keep up i only wonder why we're in a water shortage I don't care. It's not my water. <laughs> Kevin's just dumping all the water. 
the, directly down the drain. It's all right, more flow, it's fine. All right, so talking about EVAC or Acorn, whatever you guys refer to it as, there's two different companies that make it, but like I said, it's the same damn thing. Uh, works off of principle. Uh, there's a, I'm going to have to put some pictures up. Um, there's an accumulator box uh, after the drain. Accumulator box or buffer box, depending on, on, on the manufacturer. Usually off that, that buffer box, there is a black puck probably about the size of a silver dollar that has a hose fitting on there and that hose fitting goes to the black control line that goes up into the actual control where you can push the button to you know actuate the actuator at the top the way this actually works is there there's pressure as you fill up that accumulator or buffer box the water pressure is going to uh, rise because the you know the water level is rising pushing up uh, inches of water column on there and then activating uh, actuator which in turn drains out the water so a lot of times when you show up and this thing is overfilling a lot of times it's because someone had tried to pull pull the line and you know check to make sure there's no leaks or anything but when they put it back together they basically did not drain the box before they connected the the black line and back up to the control that accumulator or buffer box has to be completely empty before you try to calibrate that thing. And the reason why is because if you have it set at 50% water in that, in that accumulator, then you plug it into the control. Now it thinks 50% is now zero. So now it's trying to overfill that buffer box with a whole bunch of water in order to achieve that water column to activate the control, which activates the accumulator. So make sure that when you are working on them and you, you're, you know, you are trying to calibrate them, make sure that you do fully empty that box out and also clean any debris that might be in there that might be giving it a false reading. Typically, they try to maintain anywhere from 16 to 27 inches of uh, vacuum on the whole system. Typically, two pumps on there. They are piloted watered pumps. So there, there are small lines on there right in the head where it actually directs water right into the screws there and if that line becomes blocked up it's almost like an accumulator line or an economizer line on a, on a, a scroll compressor if that becomes blocked up with debris and you don't have that flow then it's not operating at, at full capacity but basically these pumps go off in a lead like function so we have one pump will start off once the pressure activates that it needs to bring it has a pressure switch on there uh, that reads in, in, in inches of mercury. So if we're to get down, to, oh, I'm sorry, all the way up to 16 inches or 18 inches, it activates the um, the first pump. And if the pressure continues to rise as the first pump goes on, then it'll activate the next one. Then the following cycle, now number two will be the first one to come on. And then number uh, one will be the second one to come on if it needs to. Kevin, anything you want to add? Like, like you said, just making sure that sir is clean. And another thing I see guys mess up a lot is like on install, like they'll leave the hoses with a lot of slack going down down the bottom. And what happens is if that buffer box overflows enough, water will actually go down in the hose. It'll sit down in the hose and then it'll actually block the, the sensing line from getting that that pressure because that water's sitting in like a like a U-shaped uh, trap almost and it blocks that pressure from hitting that that sensor line. What you'll have to do is what I do with these typically if I if I'm having a lot of problems, I will disconnect the black hose, go up on top, and I'll blow the sensor line backwards to make sure there's no water in there. And then I will take it all back apart, drain it, clean the box, I'll hook it back up, I'll pull the slack up, and then I will uh, just leave this tiny bit of slack and I'll cut the, the sensor line. I, I just did one the other day. I cut nine feet off of it. Damn. I mean, it was a lot. It was just laying underneath the case, coiled up. The other thing is, guys, if you're having a drain plug up, do not go to town and blow the drain out with CO2 and let all the sludge and slime go down there because it's going to go right to the buffer box. It's going to be a nightmare to get it all out. Generally, I like EVAC. I don't work on Acorn at all. I, we, we do all EVAC stuff with us. So generally, right before the EVAC box, there's a T on a 70-degree angle. Just be aware, when you're blowing this thing out, make sure the kick rail is on. Because whatever you blown out, like that snot and everything, it's going to blow right out that T. If the T is still plugged up, you're not going to get flow to the buffer box. What I've been doing lately is I will take the uh, floor scrubber and I will hook it up to the T and put my hand where the buffer box is. And I will suck everything out of the cases with the floor scrubber. So oh, that, wow. way, that way I know I got the, everything clear. 
and then I'll take the buffer box out and I'll clean the shit out of it. I already got burned by this last last Thursday, and I'm getting a call back for for water leaks. This is my second second one last week for for water leaks evac because I blew the drains out. I knew better. I didn't pull the collector box out, and I didn't I didn't go clean it because it was in a bitch spot. And I couldn't. So get, Kevin got a call back. I I got actually three of them last week. One of them was a call forward. It was it was a, it was a claymore mine basically behind an electrical panel. Like I mean, it was it was it was a trap. Yeah, the water leaks to, totally avoidable. It was my it was my fuck up. The drain was plugged up. I I didn't blow it out for at first. I sucked everything out of the case with the with the floor scrubber. So I figured I you know I shot water in there. I, I shot CO2 in there. I blew the drain out. I flushed five gallons of water. It was working. Yeah, lo and behold, two days later, it's leaking again because the collector box was plugged up with shit. And it was just blocking the sensor line. So generally what I do is I pull the collector box out. I make all my guys put them in with uh, with rubber clamps on both sides of them. Oh, are you talking about the fern, the, like the Fernco couplings? Yeah, I, I, make them, I make my guys put Fernco's on both sides of the box so that way nobody has to cut anything that they just take the fern coats off they can pull the box right out unfortunately the, the ones i didn't do didn't have fern coats on both sides so i would have had to cut the line and it was four o'clock and i really didn't feel like cutting cutting the line and get, going to get fern coats i mean it ended up burning me so another thing you don't want to do right away is uh just jam the button on the evac actuator on the on the controller why not it's there yeah, but I mean, if there's a problem, you're not going to be able to figure it out. You're going to have to fill that box back up to see it, see what the issue is. Yeah, and it might not fill up to the exact same part that it failed the last time. So, you know, it's just like anything. When you're walking up to a frozen food case, you know, or a medium temp case, and you know it's frozen up, check out what, you know, what it looks like, right? So you can kind of assess what might have happened. That goes the same way with an, with an e-corn or an AVEX. Oh, my God, I just totally fucked up. <laughs> What's an e-corn? A, a, a <laughs> I told you I'm dyslexic, right? <laughs> yeah, you'll have that. <laughs> oh, mother of God. <laughs> I'm totally, I'm totally lost you. <laughs> so, like, on another, another note, like, the way these are piped is very specific. Like, the way the fittings, they don't want you using 90s. They want you using 45s because they don't want a sharp, sharp turn on these and uh, anything going through a pipe because of the velocity going through there. I guess like it'll actually, if it's a 90, it could actually shatter the pipe and go right through. So in our, in our training facility, what we did was in, in, in Fullerton, what we, uh, we put in pieces of uh, clear, uh, clear plexiglass throughout, you know, plexiglass tubing throughout. So you can see like how fast this thing just take, takes off. See a turd going through there at, at mock speed. Uh, you know what? Now I got a thought for next time I'm in Fullerton. So they, uh, <laughs> They actually evac and Acorn both make black water vacuum pumps. Really? Yeah. So I went to some like training. And it was for mm -hmm. and the guy's going through it from Acorn. And he's like, "Yeah, you guys are gonna be the one servicing the store." I'm like, "Okay." And he's like, "Yeah, it does the black water too." I'm like, "Excuse me." He's like, "Yeah, it does the the, the toilets are all Acorn. Everything else, like, not me, Chief. I'm a, I'm not a shitter fitter. I'm out. I'm yeah. out." I, oh, do, I don't work on, I'm like, it has a maciator on. I'm like, this is disgusting. He's like, yeah, we have these at a prison. Like there's a prison in Indiana, Indianapolis where they have them. He's like, it'll, it'll take, it'll cut up a bed sheet. Excuse me. It'll cut up a bed sheet. So if anyone from dispatch is listening in the greater Chicago, Indiana area, if you get a call for the, for the, for the, for the jail, Kevin wants to go work on the system. Yeah. Like I, I, I couldn't imagine having it. That is gonna be some nasty. Oh God, no! Yeah, <laughs> I do. I like so. So any of my kids, um, they got lots of of, of showers. Oh, you shit the diaper. We're going in the shower. It's shower time. I just bleh, nope. Uh, -uh can't do it. So yeah, unfortunately, they make black water acorns and evacs. That sounds disgusting. They. So the other thing, guys, it, to watch out for is. Vacuum loss. Say you come to a store and you have water literally everywhere and the vacuum pumps are just running nonstop. Generally, what I will do is I will just start listening for the whistle. One of these cases, you're going to hear it. You're going to hear the pinch valve up in the ceiling 
or it's going to be sucking all the time down by the floor. Go so ahead, I have a recommendation because I got burned by this because I, I went to a store that I, I don't even share to count how many people actually went there. But um, I went there and I was told that there is a leak on the system and we can't find it. And I started wasting my time and I was like, you know what, you know, we went over every bit of this piping, every nook and cranny, every crawl space, you know, anywhere. And we didn't find anything. And, you know, I I almost, I started on the valve, on the actuator valve, there's a vacuum line on the opposing side of the actuator towards the, you know, you'd call the house suction, you know, where, where it's pulling that vacuum. And I was putting my digital gauges on there, trying to shut off valves to see if it was up in the piping and I was shutting off every branch. And so finally I ended up just going to the machine itself and making sure that it could achieve suction. And that was the problem. One pump um, by itself couldn't do it. And the second one, it was barely making. And what it ended up being was, you know, because they have a, a water line that's actually ran to those systems for the for the pilot portion of the water, you know, for those pumps. Right. So they can keep a, a, a direct seal. Um, the problem was that these filters were bypassed. So it was getting instantly shit water. And then it just calcified all that all that salt in the, in the water and basically jammed up every orifice and prevented this thing from actually achieving a vacuum. And I, I sat there for probably about a good seven, eight hours trying to drill this fitting out, shoving pieces of baler wire through, just trying to get this thing to, to pull down the vacuum. And that's basically what it was. There was no leak on the store. It was the, the whole pump package needed to be replaced at that point. So if you're going to check and you're told that there's a, you know, it's not maintaining suction valve off the two ball valves right after the check valves um, on the main branch going out to the store and verifying that the machine can actually pull suction first before you assume that it's something out in the out in the system. Yeah, I mean, but generally it's going to be out in the system. But yeah, that, that that's yeah, I agree. Check that, but like generally when it's when it's constantly running, you'll hear it. Like I've had guys call me and you could literally hear the whistling in the background. You're like, hey, chief, uh, do you normally hear that at the store? Like that horrible whistling sound. Go, go to the whistle. It, it, it's literally calling you. And one, one of the things that can cause that to, to keep feeding like that, you could have an actual actuator that's bad, the valve actuator. A lot of times what will happen is there's a different chamber versus the chamber where the air goes through and where the actual vacuum is occurring to make that actuator open up. A lot of times what you'll find when you have a control acting funny, you know, the little push button override switch, a lot of times what you'll find is you'll have water inside that control. And typically that happens from an actuator that has ruptured its seal. So no long, there's no longer two separate chambers. So now the water can go in the sensing line. And then once that happens, it takes out the control. And once that happens, then everything has to be replaced including that little itty bitty red check valve on the vacuum side of the, of the system. Yeah. I mean, generally when you see them sticking, <clears throat> what I usually see in them is they have foreign debris in them. Like there's a price tag stuck in it. There's uh, some kind of foreign debris in there. Like uh, sh- there's just nastiness price tag chunks of whatever God knows what was growing in that case, little trees also, what, what can happen as well is the sensing line that comes off of the after uh, on the collector box or on the sensing, uh, I forget what the, the, it's, oh, I'm sorry, it's called a standpipe, um, where basically they're building their own collector box, their own accumulator, and then they put a standpipe for the, you know, for the pressure. If the line between the standpipe and the actuator, I'm sorry, the line between the sensor and the actual vacuum control is leaking like it has a little pinhole in it where it's going to lose the vacuum of that water pressure building up that could be a, another key reason why a system might be overfilling um, on a particular case so just be aware of that as well sometimes it's just easier just to if you assume that cut it out it'll take you a couple seconds to replace that piece of uh, that rubber hose control over to the actual standpipe next thing let's go over how the skid works so you have the vacuum pumps. Brett went over how they're 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 water cooled and sealed vacuum pumps. 
So the vacuum pumps pull through two check valves on the return side. So you have the, you have the two check valves there. Your, your water is going to come back down through the check valves. It's going to get sucked through, and then it's going to go to these collector tanks, reservoirs, collectors. They both call them different things. So they don't sue each other. Um, so you're going to go into these collector tanks. The water collects in there. Then there is a float switch in there. Once the float switch makes the microprocessor controller says, okay, I have enough water in here. So I'm going to blow down the vacuum. Now it does it by a solenoid valve on the top of the tank. You'll see a, a uh, solenoid valve with like a uh, kind of like orifice looking deal on there. Like a, scru- like a snubber or a scruffer just to kind of keep the uh, slow, the slow down the flow. And what it does is it, it allows that tank to pressurize. And when it does that, the check valve that's on the bottom of the tank now opens because it's not being sucked closed anymore. And then all the water drains out of the t- out of the reservoir tank. Now, like say if you have a high level alarms, like an evac, if it's not draining high level alarms. Hey guys, today's episode is sponsored by Westermeyer Industries serviceable oil floats. Many oil separators contain an oil float to effectively meter separated oil back to the compressors. Westermeyer Industries has taken this concept and perfected it. With their new line of serviceable oil floats, these floats feature an improved design with fewer components, allowing for greater manufacturer consistency and up to 20% increased oil flow versus their legacy models. These floats also feature an integrated magnet to shield the oil path from debris and have been field proven in supermarket applications. Westmeyer Industries offer replacement oil floats not only for their own separators, but also cross-compatible models for our competitor oil separators as well. You can find out more about the Westermeyer Industries serviceable oil floats by visiting westermeyerind.com backslash floats. Once again, that's westermeyerind.com slash float. Let's get on with the episode. Question number one for the month of September. If you have a pulse width valve and that valve is pulsing four seconds, what is the percentage that valve is open? Let me know. This month we're giving away a field piece new digital scale. Email your answers to arpgiveaways at gmail.com. Thanks, guys. That solenoid uh, could be causing the issue. Either it's not getting energized from the microprocess controller or it's plugged up or it's bad. And if that is the case and you only have one tank, if you have a smaller evac, uh, you are screwed. If you have two tanks, you at least could run like half capacity. So that's just one thing to take, you know, keep in mind. You don't want to ever flood it because if you flood it, the vacuum pumps are going to chug water and that's not what they're made to do. So they will shut themselves down. Uh, another thing to look out for on these things is the contactors, the motor starters, like they wear out. I mean, you guys can remember, these are like a compressor. Think of it like a compressor. I mean, the, those things are cycling hundreds of times a day on and off to maintain that vacuum pressure. So when you're doing PMs, uh, a lot of times you those things are small and you can't uh, you can't check them. I I generally replace them once a year. Like it's cheap insurance. I mean, if you lose one of those pumps, they are expensive. Well, not just that, but I mean, it's it's. It, I don't know how many times I've found where the because they, they typically have an overload, right? They typically have a start, you know, a motor starter, which is a compiled of a contactor and an actual. Uh, overload protection so a lot of times you'll find after a power failure you know it happens in dfw all the time you go there reset it well then that means it's single phased while it was running which means you're putting excessive wear on those contactors so like kevin said it's just it's a hell of a lot cheaper just to replace the damn things yeah i mean generally i find them tripped it for like power surges out here like i think it's like a number one call for power surges out here especially like the aldi like they, it, it's tripped, it's tripped evac contactors. Like I generally check, I make sure guys check them every single time. Now there's a power outage. I want them to open up the evac panel because generally it'll be one of the two that are tripped. And then you end up getting an evac alarm randomly at you, right after you leave. You want to make sure that thing is, uh, is not tripped on one of the pumps. So, but I mean, that, that thing is just, 
you know, incredibly important. Like that, that thing is is just as important as the rack. I mean, slip and falls cost a ton of money. So water leaks are bad. Have you ever seen the uh, sensor port leak test instruction sheet that they have out there? I have not. All right. Well, basically, I'll share it with you right now. I'm gonna put this up on the on the Facebook group. Um, so it says uh, for testing the sensor port leak test. So push the manual button on the controller to clear the accumulator. So you're going to you try to clear out the, the box on the bottom. Uh, remove the sensor tube from the sensor port cap. Attach a quarter inch ID clear hose to the sensor port cap. Create a loop in the clear tube and fill with water to create two equal levels of water. So it looks like you're basically filling, uh, filling it up so it looks almost like a manometer. And then pour water into the accumulator from the air intake in the case. Water will displace the air. Water will now be at two different levels in the loop. Watch for about a minute and see if the water goes back to the level position. There is a leak in one of the joints. Oh, no way. I've never done that before. Um, the only other thing that I, that I can tell you, uh, sometimes you can power, like if you have a clog in some of these, you can do what's called a power flush. Um, I had, used to have a ball that, uh, like one of those rubber, uh, I don't know what they call them, pickle balls. Uh, on a, a piece of rope I'd do is I would drop it down behind the case and I had at least two of them and I was able to drop those balls directly over the ports that they have open for the vent and then hit the accumulator button and then all of a sudden you have a great vacuum a great vacuum than what you would because now it's not trying to suck any air you know from the ambient yeah I know Acorn used to when we used to do work for them absolutely hated uh they make you drop like a tennis ball cut in half and uh yeah I feel like they they just like make you want to sell parts because they're just like take this apart now now take this apart oh write this up too it's like listen guy i mean the actuator's bad like i'm not here to change nine thousand parts that aren't bad but you know to their defense it, isn't it really nice when you actually have a part that's bad and the little tackle box that they have around top of the damn rack is filled up with at least one of each device that you would need. Yeah, they get real mad when uh, you're on one of their calls and you're like, I have an actuator in my truck, but it's an evac one. I'm going to go ahead and throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll just, we'll, we'll bill them for that. We'll bill them for another one. We'll, we'll send it out to them. Cool. We'll... They, they work damn good. I, I think acorns. I think acorns is more superior quality. Properly, I mean, besides having to you know de-ice a case and have it overfill all over the floor, that's really the only problem I have with it. You know what I mean? Like if it's set up properly, they're fairly reliable. Eighty percent of the problems are maintenance, meaning like case cleanings. But here's the Absolutely. problem: Absolutely. nobody cleans their cases properly, and and or like meat cases where they get the slime in there like what do you, what do you mean nobody does you're, oh, you're talking you you have contractors out there that, that that are quality contractors you're telling me that, that they're not doing their job okay and, so customers is is doing their own maintenance on by cleaning their cases which in turn is causing debris to go down the drains and then causing the failures. Like, you get a couple of price tags down there you're like you're you're done you're sol and then what's actually worse is all these <laughs> cases trying to fit these acorn boxes they they know it is like they're so low these id cases they're shipping out with half inch drain ports like we're coming out of the bottom of the trap is half inch that's what that's what husband wants you come dude a fucking grape gets stuck in that you're done the grape shuts down the whole drain i i but like they're so low we've actually had to take unistrut and put set the cases on strut wow because we could not get the buffer box underneath the case and drain it in there there's there's physically no room between the case pan and that. Looks like Acorn's gonna or gonna have to start making smaller fittings for that now. And the the other problem we've had with uh, Evac and Acorn, which has only been brought up in a couple places, is technically by plumbing code, you're supposed to have one and a half times the drain diameter of an air gap going into the drain, which would be the they consider the collector box the drain. Oh, so. Wow. You're supposed to have one and a quarter times drain diameter. So if it's a one inch drain, it's supposed to be an uh, inch and a half. You're supposed to have an inch and a half air gap. You cannot have that with that. Oh, okay. I got you. I got you. 
Because so the, whole, have, the whole way the system's designed. Yeah. How, have you ever found a bad check valve uh, up at the top of the system, like uh, up above the riser? So, like after the accumulator box, when it, you know, after um, after the actuator where it goes up, there's typically a clear check valve up there. Have you ever found a bad check valve? And like, what what would that actually cause? Like, I'm, I'm like on a circuit. Yeah, Evacs don't have those. They don't. So they just no. they strictly rely on the on the Until, actuator. That's it. That's it. So Kevin referred to it as an X valve. It can be called an extractor valve, X valve, or uh, VL valve. Pinch, pinch valve. I, generally, they call it the EVAC calls it a pinch valve a lot. But yeah, they 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 don't have check valves. I think the Acorns have check valves in them. Correct? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, if you fail the check valve, it really wouldn't do anything, just for the fact that the the pinch valve is going to stop it. Agreed. Agreed. I don't know what else uh, that would be used for un- unless you have unless you have water. They just don't want all that water coming right back that, down in, um, which, go ahead. It, yeah, so if you lost vacuum, like, that would be a problem. Yeah, because then all your water would basically flow in the other direction and then push against the, the X valve and then flow over the case. All right, but that's also why, you know, when you, when that standpipe comes off, when you have your riser come up and before it goes into the check valve, Going up off the off of the the main drop, going into the drain, it actually drops in at like a forty five degree angle, going back down to make sure that that doesn't happen. But like I said, acorn on top of that, they also put that that check valve right where right before that forty five would be. So you'd come up higher than the actual main drain, and then forty five down into it. So like one thing, like so. If you pay attention to the evac specs, like they spec a certain height, like you can only have so much of a riser. Heights like twelve to thirteen feet higher. There's their internal spec where they want it. Oh, so that's, that's right, why because they're so tall. Yeah, that's why they have a lot of because they they lose the vacuum trying to at times trying to suck up all the all the water from there. That's why it's like such a nightmare to de-ice. So my, my big thing is that if you're building a new store, there's no point in putting evac in just for the fact that, like, especially on stationary things, just put the drains in. Well, I mean, so if anyone doesn't know, the reason why they use a corner evac system is, is basically there, it's a lot cheaper instead of having to dig up the whole entire floor, the, you know, wherever you're moving the new cases. Because you have, let's just say you have an old building and you're making that into a supermarket. Well, shit, I mean, now I got to dig up the whole floor to put drain lines in wherever, you know, where, in the concrete where it need to be. This way with the acorn or evac system, you don't have to. But then the, the service return is that you have a little bunch of uh, service years. stuff on it. What's up? And the service man pays for it for the next 20 years trying to de-ice cases, just hating his life at 2 o'clock in the morning, saying, you know what? Fuck it. I'm letting the aisle flood. <laughs> well, if, if Kevin wouldn't get so many callbacks and fix stuff right the first time, then there wouldn't be so many iced up cases and then people would be happier because they wouldn't have to be laying on the floor in, in a puddle of, of, of uh, you know, carrot water. Uh, I'm not missing iced up cases. My stuff isn't yet re-ice. It's not a call. It's not a callback. It's a learning experience. <laughs> the future learning experience. But no, like seriously though, like I, I just, I don't get the whole thing. Like, I get it during remodels. Yeah, like it saves money. Like you don't want to saw cut this nice pretty floor. But like on new construction, like Aldi, every single store is evac and they don't remodel a store. Like they gut a store. They don't just like add a case. They gut the entire store. But they do it. But Costco does it while, while the store is still running. So. No, every new store we, we put evac in from the ground up. Really? Well, so also, if you guys aren't aware, remember how we said that the pumps are, you know, they're, they're water piloted driven pumps where they have to have water going through them. They actually have to maintain a water level inside of them at all times. I believe it's supposed to be bouncing in between a half and three quarter full. There's actually a, a like a, almost looks like a fuel gauge on top of the pump um, where it's, you know, where it'll say E and, and, and F for full. And that water level has to be maintained. Well, there's a float inside the back end side of this pump assembly where it basically is 
trying to maintain a certain level within there. So you can have not enough water and you can also have too much water. You know, like Kevin said, they're not supposed to take on, you know, full bore water, but they still need the water to operate. So yeah, I mean, those things can be replaced. Um, they're kind of a pain in the ass because you have to, you know, they, if someone put disconnecting fittings, like typically what I see is, you know, someone will put um, like washing machine hoses on there um, to make it a little bit easier for servicing. Um, but then there's a back fitting that has to be screwed out. It has to be delicately taken out. And then typically that's one of the other pieces that they usually have in the fix kit is that, uh, you know, that level uh, that maintaining level uh, piece inside the actual pump assembly to maintain that water inside that pump. So that's another reason why that suction wouldn't maintain is if the pump wasn't filled up with the aqua amount of water. And the water fill solenoid, same thing. There's a, uh, there's a strainer inside the inlet to the water solenoid. So I've seen a lot of times like the filters will get plugged up. Guys will pull them in the middle of the night and the, you know, they'll go to order a filter. They forget about it. And then the strainer gets plugged up for the solenoid. So generally, you know, I'll, I'll clean that also. It's just like a, it literally looks like a, a garden hose type strainer. It's like in, it's a, just shoved in there. Same with those water solenoids. If you guys have one of those fail, instead of ordering from Evac or, or Acorn, you can go to Granger and get that. It's just an ass cold water solenoid or like a general supply house. Like we have a plumbing slash refrigeration supply house. We buy all our stuff from like they have those ASCO solenoids on, on the shelf. It's, 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 it's a common water filled solenoid. They use in boilers and chillers a lot. So like that, that is a common part you can get pretty much anywhere. So like instead of like letting those things run dry and uh, burn up, I mean, you're better off just getting that ASCO solenoid. Uh, one other thing I wanted to go over. So like, okay, so if you have glycol uh, systems, what I generally do is I'll put a coffee filter. So if we're having glycol leaks in the store with EVAC and uh, find them in the drains, kind of a nightmare. So I will take a coffee filter and strap it to the uh, outlet of the, uh, the dump line for the evac when it goes to dump. So that way I will know if the coffee filter is getting covered in glycol. If we have a small glycol leak, you know, you could either see it colored and if the store doesn't let you color, like, like one particular customer, you could actually smell it on the coffee filter. You'll smell the, you'll smell the glycol on there. So you'll know it's, it's coming from a sales floor case instead of, you know, you wasting time looking through POS boxes that are drained to the floor. You know that, uh, it's coming through a sales floor case somewhere and uh, that glycol is getting picked up by the evac because now you can't check it in the drain anymore. Like I would normally throw coffee filters under the drain of the cases if I, if it instead of pulling them all so I could find out what cases, you know, I'm leaking my glycol through and you could smell it in the end or see it. But I mean, a lot of times you'll have to do that with the evac. We used to use a, um, the Milwaukee camera, like the plumbing camera and just, shove it right in the right in the return for the customers obviously that that use dye in their in their systems but unfortunately i you know i know the customer you're speaking of i've never had the the to be so fortunate to work for that customer when they had glycol any store i've ever worked in before that that particular one was all dx stuff yeah i mean even the milwaukee that the milwaukee thing still try to it's still kind of hard especially in black bottom kaiser cases it, it's yeah. it's a you see, even see dyed glycol. Well, I think that's it, man. I think we covered a, a bunch of the gamut stuff. I want to try to actually get someone on here from uh, Evac or Acorn so I can, you know, have them put up the presentation so we can ask them particular questions as we're going through the thing. But yeah, uh, too late. I already know someone from Acorn. Stop it. <laughs> whoever, whoever. All right. It, it looks good on paper. It looks great on paper. It's a great idea. It's one of those ideas where it's like, wasn't a good idea in principle. You're, you're in the field. It, once you got in the field, it was eh, not so great of an idea. You know, I do have to say, though, like a lot of the problems that I have seen has been installation problems, which is amazing because they do such a, a well detailed uh, print of how it's supposed to be set up. And I just don't understand why people can't follow said print. Because most of the time the shitter fitters put them in because it's 
wastewater. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a uh, construction job with the plumbers, but they usually are the most special of trades. I, I'm, I'm being serious. Like it's. Three trades been walking to a bar. <laughs> That's one of the guys that are drilling dr or drilling holes in the bottom of drain pans, the amount of electrical boxes. So who does that? Does that is that the shitter fitters? Is that someone else that actually does that? That's, See, I, that's, I, that's the electricians. I, I never, I never had this happen in ten years until like last year. I walked into a store for startup, and the all the fitters were gone for a week because we were so far ahead of everybody. And it came in, and every single evaporator coil they had. Oh, we're, we're ready to go. We're trimmed out. And I look, and I'm like, oh my god, they drilled. They they mounted the fucking electrical boxes right to the bottom of the evaporator shot a nipple through it and brought all their wire through the bottom of the evaporator I'm, and on the pan. I'm like, wow. And then I went to another job. Same thing happened. And then we had, it was like a rash of them for like a month. You know, it, what's really hard for some electricians and I'm not going to speak for all of them. I just know from, from working, doing remodels, you know, when we're doing certain work in certain areas where you no, know, you can't touch the high voltage, Brett, you can only touch the low voltage. Okay. You're going to have an electrician with you. Okay and trying having electricians certain electricians work on control wiring uh just 208 to i don't know what it is about 208 or 240 it confuses the shit out of them like i had to draw out a print for the guy i was working with so he understood how to wire up the time clock so i was trying to describe you know how, how a hard wire interlock works yeah but totally just didn't understand or that was like i can you draw that out and it's like well how is it gonna be common i'm like it's connected on the other side but how is it 208 then if it's if it has a common like isn't that gonna it was, just wasn't fun at all so it's actually in most construction specs that the pipe fitters are the ones who trim out the wires say it one more time so it's actually in most customer specs that the pipe fitters trim out most of the wires the low voltage or the high voltage? Volt. So, uh, like with Walmart, it is in the it is in the refrigeration RC scope to trim out all connections. Same thing with Target. Like Target, we trim out when you do like a Target remodel. Like we trim out all the low voltage and all the high voltage. They the only thing they trim out is power supplying a unit, meaning like four hundred and sixty supplying a rack. Like all interconnecting control wires is all the RC for that very reason that they do not trust the electricians to do it. But they pull the wire and I, I will say this, they, they will let the house electrician pull the wire and you'll get on a job and you're like, what the fuck is this? Like it's all duct taped and it's like wire number 3018C, like, Dude, this is not in the print. Like they gave you a print with wire numbers, like to like label the same. Well, I made my own print. What do you mean you made your own print? That's rough. Yeah, but I mean that that's just how it is. They don't they don't they don't trust the electricians to, to trim out their own stuff. Uh, so someone asked me uh, how difficult startup was, and I was like, it, you just you need to be able to understand like the whole mechanical end in order to understand how it needs to be wired electrically. And I think that might be part of the problem with the electricians. You know, they don't understand the theory of how things are supposed to work. So um, which safety is supposed to go where and how that's supposed to be, you know, wired in with this. I think that's, that's where some of the disconnect happens, you know, it isn't lights or outlets or light switches. Most of them are completely lost. So how do they do three way switches then? Oh, dude, it's it is rough. <laughs> I mean, most of most of them have a little book, Ugly's the cheat book, where they like cheat cheat with it. Like, I mean, I'm gonna be honest to you. Like, I mean, most of them struggle. Most of them are good for pulling wire and putting up pipe. Run, running conduit, running conduit, <laughs> running conduit, and pulling wire. Well, I, I I do have to say, one electrician did like I I freaked out because I had a I had a rope break when I was pulling low voltage wire through because. They, when the spec was made from the engineer, they didn't take into how many wires that I actually needed to do what they wanted on the other print. So the EMS print would say that we needed all these sensors. Okay, no problem. And you gave me half inch conduit. <laughs> 
So like I I had to get really really creative, but I, I just as I remember I was pulling wire, and the, the rope snapped. I don't know if I got it snagged on something when I was initially putting it up or whatever, but um you know he had put all these pieces of of you know pull string and all these all you know all these undergrounds, and I freaked out when when I snapped it off and he taught me the parachute trick where you basically you know hook a plastic bag on the end tie it on put it on a vacuum cleaner and suck that thing through and it'll just sail right through that damn pipe i that's one thing that i've learned that's been really helpful from electrician yeah i make them pull the wire i turn it I, i'm not pulling it that way that way i could yell at them when it's snagged <laughs> Well, you didn't pull enough conduit. That's why the conduit's too small. So, all right, guys. All right, have a nice night. All right I'm gonna put some of the stuff, uh, the some of the stuff that has all the uh, specs for the Acorn system up on the uh, Facebook group for Advanced Refrigeration. And guys, have a good night. <laughs>